my garage sale content. It is scary if you look carefully under the hood how my garage sale content leads to business for VaynerMedia with Fortune 500 companies because the people that are consuming the garage sale content are the children of the executives who are making the decisions to go with VaynerMedia. Content is never a bad thing. This portion is like with me, so I think this is when you need to get selfish. Like you need to ask your question. Hiring is guessing, firing is knowing. Like you gotta go fast. That's how you get shit done. That's how you figure stuff out. This is the television. And the television is the radio. The 40s, motherfuckers. And I'm going full time on my personal brand. Good for Thanks you. to you because last year you told me to get on TikTok and I did and I hated it, but I still <laughs> hate it, but, <laughs> but here I am. Um, so yeah, personal finance. Yep. Um, and then I also have a podcast that I co-host, which is more in the like navigating the workplace, employee advocacy, that type of thing. And I'm trying to figure out how to put those two things together. But yeah, Vancouver, Canada. Um, and now putting all my time and energy into building. Good all for you. Brand. Awesome. You know Jeremy. Very well. Jeff Jeffrey. Hi, I'm Jeffrey. I can't uh, say hi to Jeremy. Say hi to <laughs> it's good to see you, brother. How you been? Good. We're gonna give you a little walk and talk back to your office. Sure. Awesome. I loved it last time. I'm uh, Jeffrey Travis, uh, founder of Zeal Concentron, awesome. and uh, we're a virtual reality studio that produces virtual reality experiences. Our mission is to move people through the magic of immersive storytelling. Um, so we produce VR content, but we also have a technology that is a motion pod that eliminates motion sickness, makes the experience far more immersive with scent and haptics. And uh, primarily we're building a network of virtual reality theaters in places like museums, tourist centers. Um, and Interesting. We're about building, uh, a lot theaters. of B2B. Yeah. Makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. Pleasure. So here to learn. How to Where are you from? Go. I'm sorry. Uh, based in LA. LA. Awesome. So I'm Kaya. This is Yasmin. We're sister in laws. Yeah. Um, we have a company called Bia that helps women from all the way from puberty through menopause. So onset of menses. Interesting. It balance their hormones. And it uses whole foods. So we're all about food as medicine. I think like 80% of women have hormonal imbalances and don't know what to do. They're giving band aids like. I don't know if I should say this on camera, birth control, things like that. And we want to give them like an actual solution to their problem. I love that. And we launched last year only direct to consumer, subscription based, and 100% self funded. Wow, it's awesome. All Whole Foods? All Whole Foods. I'm such a buyer of this thesis. It changed my life. And we're like, we gotta get this out to more women. I have a disproportionately educated girlfriend when it comes to Whole Foods. <laughs> I'm like stunningly educated through osmosis. I'm well more prepared to help you now than before. So can't wait. Good for you. I, th- I think you really, the, there's real upside in that. Other than DTTC businesses are very hard. There's that part. We'll talk about it. All right, now this whole side of the table comes from Canada, so we're gonna start with these folks in the middle who are all one group here. Uh, Christine, one of you guys didn't say hi to Gary. And introduce your peeps. Hi, Gary. So I'm Christine Lewington, CEO and founder of PIP International. Uh, this is my daughter, Shelby. She's in charge of marketing. And this is Troy, he's here for High Five. So what we are is we're an ag tech company and we extract the protein out of yellow peas, so plant-based, mm-hmm. and it's a clean plant-based protein and we're going to disrupt the industry because pea protein tastes like shit and ours does not. And so we have large companies, I can't say them on camera, sure. that are at the table and how do I close them and how do I raise the <coughs> real money because I just, right now currently the guys are commissioning our $30 million pilot facility and we're going to the $200 million. I bought the land, everything else is engineered and we're going big because you can't go small. Makes they sense. want tens of thousands of yeah. metric tons. You of course. just do a little bit. And so I've partnered with HiFi, who does things that you, I think, are going to understand the NFT raising money. So I'll hand it over to Troy. Yeah, quickly, Gary. So I'm Troy McDonald. I'm the chairman and CEO of HiFi Corp, a small U.S. public company. It's trying to become a big company. Um, we've uh, built a securities token offering platform for clients very much like that. She's become an investor in our company as well. Uh, Agritech, green tech, these things are essential to humanity. Uh, these pub- these private companies are looking to do capital raises and we're going to be using our platform to do security token offerings. We have a new form of NFT. We think we can take NFTs from being, most of them being foolish to being very serious. And we actually have a new form of security token offering, completely legally compliant in the US, EU, um, and now in Canada. 
You have to be an cre- accredited investor or no? Uh, for some types of offerings, for her first offering, yes, it'll be a Reg D, 506C, yep. but we'll also be doing Reg A's and yep. not need to be accredited. Understood. Okay, awesome, great, thank you. And we got Nuno. Hi, um, so I'm Nuno, uh, originally from Portugal, living in Canada for eight years now. What part um, of I Canada? Influencer marketing agency. Ninety mm-hmm. percent um, of our business is focused on promoting gaming. gaming. Uh, so we do um, dedicated videos integrations um, in the most organic way possible. Yep. Because I've been trying to um, do it on a different way from those other platforms. Um, so we have been growing, and I hit kind of a threshold that I didn't know where to go from here. Yep. So I was uh, approached few times for people to try to acquire my company. Um, I didn't know what to do. And then I booked Matt Higgins on intro. Um, so I met Matt and he said like, you're crazy. You're not going on that direction. You're gonna learn how to build your second tier um, of your company, your management team um, that you don't have at the moment. Um, and you will grow your business. Um, and definitely you will need like the 40s help. Uh, to, to, to That's awesome. Matt. That's very nice, Matty. It's funny. <laughs> Very cool. Where are you based? Um, Kingston, okay. And do you rep the talent? Uh, no. You rep we, the brands? Yes. Understood. Cool. Cool. Let's go back there. Inga, yeah. let's rock and roll. Yeah, so I um, have a podcast called It's Time to Lean um, with a co host with a friend, and that is all about career. Um, you know, like employee stuff, but yep. then really my personal brand, which is what I'm trying to trying to grow. Um, I'm I'm struggling. I got on TikTok. I started, you know, doing all the like repurposing the content. And what I've realized is that I'm more. I'm an indoor cat, and social media is requiring me to be an outdoor cat. And I'm I'm like struggling to figure Why? out how to like find my voice and. Why do like, you think? To grow, really. Well, let's 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 break it down because it's gonna matter for everyone in the room. So introverted versus extroverted, or yeah. however you want to paint yeah. it. What? Let's go a higher. Are you worried about judgment? No, no. I mean, I don't really give a fuck about okay. what people say. I just do you I, not have the ideas? Because that's something that I've yeah, that's yeah. something I've been thinking a lot more about. And some of you have consumed my content for a long time. Even my own team is hearing this for the first time. Even Andrew who films be like, I've been thinking a lot about the ideas. I've come to realize that. I took for granted how easy ideas are for me. We yeah. talked about this the other day for Vayner and Sasha. So this is what, one of the reasons I've started doing green screen content, again, uh, making assumptions that some of you are paying close attention to me and others aren't. Green screen, have you seen this? Where I take a headline from an article and then I'm over it and I'm talking. What, early on when TikTok was popping, something I said that I stopped talking about that I'm gonna start talking more about is, these platforms are now helping people with training wheels. Like when I first started YouTube, it was like camera, post. Now with all the filters, all the features, the music, the this and that, these platforms are really trying to put you in a position to be able to make the content. The reason I like green screen a lot is for a lot of people here, no matter, I I just listened, almost every, actually I'm gonna take this back, everybody here can speak as a commenter on top of an article within their field, whether that's private equity or influencer marketing or food or food or right or raising capital. Almost everyone here, like I woke up, had an idea. I think having a grudge might be the great poison of our society. I've been thinking about this lately a lot. That if you actually are a human being who is currently sitting with a grudge, that it's actually destroying you on an everyday basis. So I was interested in that and Normally, the way I would do it would be, I would make, you know, again, I think all of you know, like, a grudge, blah, 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 I brand and post. <laughs> White title, grudges are bad, away we go. What I did instead with this new behavior, and I've got a point here for everyone, is I Googled articles about grudges. Scientific and things of that nature. Now, I'm a little scared because I know I don't want to be a headline reader and just take something that might be a bullshit article, you know, so it's a little challenging. But this is lightweight enough, it's not like I'm making a scientific claim or a, you know, like, you know, and so uh, one thing that I'm trying to tap into for you is potentially the concept of, is it the ideas? Indoor cat, outdoor cat speaks to putting out stuff. Most common people are actually insecure about judgment and whether it's physical appearance, 
do they really know imposter syndrome, things of that nature, or just really are at that place in their life where two or three negative comments can really throw them into a snowball? If I could sense that. So then it might be about the ideas. Yeah, because I, I know what I did, and my whole thing is, you know, I want to help other women who are just like me, you know. Well, we, uh, I'm going to jump in here. What you've done is a pro. The only thing I do for a living for the last 15 years is based off of what I've done. I've just gotten good at making it more macro than a focus group of one. Yeah. It, I, it's the starting point. The only thing that you need to do in those scenarios is not be fearful of, well, wait a minute, this is I, and understand how much of this is we. Like, even 4Ds, this is a meta situation. I'm answering your question, but trust me, I'm throwing this at everybody because there's different versions of it for everyone. So I think not fearing speaking from a place of one and understanding how most things are universal and just changing some of the words of I to we may give you a starting point. Yeah. Let's keep talking. This is why we have this. Yeah. I well and it's Is it I'm a not, is are I'm you not. are you lacking patience for it, us to get there? No, I like I have all the time in the world. Okay. I don't, you know, okay. It's, it's really for me more mission driven. Like I want just want to reach more women, more moms, people that are. You know, I don't have a finance degree. Well, well I don't, you, well, like, you I just taught well, everything myself. Well, you will. If it's an altruistic, emotional point of view, it's completely based on patience. I wanted to reach everyone too. Start in two thousand nine. <laughs> Very few people were watching. More people watch now. How about the fact that in 2022, I know that I haven't even begun reaching how many people I want to reach. Yeah, true. Right? It was only in the last couple of years that I'm translating my content into Portuguese. Now people in Brazil and Portugal know who I am and they didn't 24 months ago. So, you know, I, I think a lot of times if you're truly coming from a selfless place, if you are, and I think all of us come from some version of selfish and selfless place. It's being a human being. Then we really are talking about patience. Because there is no hack. I'm not gonna be able to tell you, be like, well, you know, like for example, green screen. Why am I saying that? Because green screen is over indexing. That video of me talking about grudges would have gotten 400,000 views on Instagram for my current situation. The green screen will get 1.7 million. That's, so that, that's a tactic that I love because one, it's working for people on the other side. Two, the algorithm is clearly seeing that so it's helping with organic reach. Three, it will help a lot of you make a piece of content in a way that maybe you couldn't otherwise. You have a thought, you don't know what to do in a one minute video, but if you Google an article, green screen it, and then speak what you were thinking about that subject matter, now you do have a piece of content. I have a 30 person content team Andrew will tell you that now is probably like, wait a minute, Gary's basically now just doing green screen. He's doing it by ourselves. Like, are our jobs in trouble? <laughs> like, he doesn't need us. That's powerful. That's powerful and very powerful for a lot of people here because I, you know, everyone's like, easy for you, Gary. You have a team. I'm like, but I didn't have a team for the first eight years of my content creation. What about that part of the story? So, what else? Well, what else is, so I have this podcast and I'm I'm trying to figure out how to, because all of my- Weave it in? My, yeah, weave it in, because all of my like professional experience is in leadership, like HR employee, you know, I was a manager, yep. I, you know, so, um, and I really, most companies are like shitty, most managers are shitty, and most employees like don't know what their rights are, they don't know what they can ask for or what, you know. How to go about it. And so I have this whole thing, which is really sort of skills based, like my whole career, which I love talking about. I love, you know, having. So why are you doing the podcast? Because I love that. Good. And I, and I have like so much deep knowledge um, on on that, but it's completely different from that's okay. the personal finance stuff. That's I'm okay. Like, so let okay, me give you an, in, let walls. me let me give you an, let me give you an insight. So my garage sale content. It is scary if you look carefully under the hood, how my garage sale content leads to business for VaynerMedia with Fortune 500 companies because the people that are consuming the garage sale content are the children of the executives who are making the decisions to go with VaynerMedia. Content is never a bad thing. I often, I just, I wonder if, if I think like, 
if it takes away from nobody like, cares. Oh, well, no, you're, no, oh, you're no, trying to be an, you know, nobody. Like no, 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 nobody cares enough. Okay, good. That's ego. Okay, good. Nobody's watching those two places and be like, I'm gonna take away from this for like. They don't give a fuck. Okay, good. That 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 is that is just pure ego. Like nobody cares. Okay. Nobody. By the way, you just gave the number one argument why everybody who cares about me in business doesn't want me to do ninety percent of the things I do. Gary, you can't make a fucking video that's yelling into the screen about receipts because the Jets won a football game. You're undermining your intellect. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> the end. The, 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 we have a lot of classic thoughts that were built on the old media and distribution framework. Humans are multiple things. You can be, yeah, I, right? you, yes. Like who, I saying, who, down, down. who, like, I'm who the only people that are telling you to niche down are people who sell niche courses and have never built anything for real. Yeah, I hate that. I like hate that shit. Like, so I'm don't do person. it. I Correct. So many I would tell you to do more shit. Okay. Like start a third podcast talking about kites. Right. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. Right. I'm being de- I believe the more you give the world to attach with you, there are people who are attached to me because they're Jets fans, because they like garage sales, because they like wine, because they like business because they love modern blockchain technology, because they, like, I give, think about how I'm doing it. I mean, it's everywhere, and every, like, it's complete, like, there is no logic to it by old points of view. It becomes an energy cost game, not a strategic game. If you don't have the energy to do both, that I respect. That becomes logical, right? We only have so many resources, financially or emotionally. But if you have the capacity, notice how quickly I said great when you said I love it, I didn't want to hear anything else because that is an energy driver, not sucker. People actually don't understand this. When I tell people to do a piece of, like you should do a Star Trek uh, podcast, they see it on surface level the way I say it, which is like somebody else might be a Star Trek fan and then they may give you business. What it really is in disguise is you love Star Trek so much that that hour each week is giving you energy for your other 60 hours. My obsession with the New York Jets, and I'm realizing right now because we've been so bad for so long and now we're actually having a decent season, I forgot because it's been so dreary, I forgot how that four hours on a Sunday drives my entire week. So I think you need to be doing more. It's just that the content has to be strong and strategic across the board and that's what 4Ds will teach out of like the S and sock. But that theory is not true. It's more that you just have to make more content of the thing that you want to monetize. Got it? It's not decrease the leadership thing. It's add more to the financial thing. Okay, I love it. That's awesome. I'm gonna keep doing what you tell me to do. There you go. <laughs> All right, Jeffrey. By the way, YouTube Shorts, I'm repurposing to YouTube Shorts. But when it's you like, it's like a, a hot mess. <laughs> well, it's it's only because it's early. Number two, and this is very big for all of you. Remember, when you title your YouTube Shorts video, even if it's not directly obvious to what the content you put out, if you're repurposing from TikTok, title it for search, because YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. Right? Like, so like you might make a video that like lightly touches on taxes, but you might title the video, how to file your taxes in 2023. Got it? Because you're doing it for search. All right. So, you know, I have ideas. I, I just started a campaign to start posting on LinkedIn three times a week. Um, I want to start a podcast where I interview the filmmakers. Who Correct. Your content because I'm very active. Going to but remember, festivals. when the target is a B2B decision maker, that's the sizzle. But make sure, back to like jab, 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 right hook, for every filmmaker, because that's cool, Try to have somebody on the show once every two or three times that is an actual decision maker that you're trying to reach because you'll be able to use the content from that episode as ads against decision makers and she or he's gonna say something that is disproportionately gonna resonate with the people like her or him. So where people get caught is they think their thing is boring and so they go for the cooler thing. Right? You thought properly. I'm gonna do a podcast. Who the fuck cares about the, you know, like the the li- licensing fee or the structure or some of the hardware thing? Like that's boring. What's cool is the fucking the movies, right? On the flip side, you're doing it for marketing, and you're trying to shoot fish in a barrel of a very small group of people. 
I still believe that one of the biggest things B2B companies need to do is make their content strictly for the CFO, strictly talking about why their thing saves their company money. Even if it's like, like whatever that is. That's why I love HR. All these dopey, dopey business people like disrespect HR, that's where all the money is. If you have retention and good culture, all the hidden gray of the money you're making versus the black and white all the CFOs pay attention to, it's not even a fair race. It's a tortoise in the hair. Nonetheless, um, give that some thought, okay? Right, okay, that sounds good. Um, and then the other thing I was wondering about is just in terms of calibrating the breadth of the message. So if I start writing posts, I want to create content, I can get very, uh, this is a struggle. Both. I get very specific. Both. Narrative and, narrative. and. Talk about what the message and. is. For both. Okay. And, this is, again, this is the sub, you know how we talk about subconscious bias now in society? Like, you don't realize, but you have these feelings and, I'm trying to get people to be okay with that because we're just human beings. We grew up in our circumstances and the quicker we realize we do have it and the quicker we also don't judge people for having it, the quicker this world can get nice. Everything is and. It's unbelievable how deep the subconscious bias of or is in business. If you're posting three times a week, and you know I want you to post four times a day, but if you're doing three times a week, think about what you're asking. You're doing 12 posts a month. And there's not the... Like what comes to mind is that am I gonna seem very inconsistent? I'm going to This like, goes back to the ideology of like, there's nobody's gonna read all 12 to begin with. Yeah. Who are we looking inconsistent to? Again, what, what is really starting to, and it's amazing, it's right off the bat on both of these, we have a major, major issue with over-believing academia and under-believing reality. The concept of, of who's consistent about anything? Of course you're a human being and you have your values and what have you, but like all of us as parents and operators and human beings have to adjust to reality at all times. We also should start championing people's ability to change their mind. That is my greatest strength. New data, new decisions. New information, new life situation, new th- observations. You're not gonna bother anybody if you go high sizzle metaverse and then come down hardcore, nerdy, you know, motion uh, sickness technology. But then those people aren't they gonna see the other one and go like, oh, this is so pedantic, right? Why, why Do you believe so humans work that way? <clears throat> yeah, like that's, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I'm, matter, I to your point, one of the, re- I almost think that the reason I'm doing some of the stuff I'm doing is to go to the extreme. I'm like a very well-respected businessman who's wildly not respected by the establishment because they see a video of me buying a t-shirt for a dollar and give zero fucks because there's no reason to. All you're trying to win on is relevance to as many people as possible. The people that will eliminate you because you're talking about multiple things are the least interesting people on earth. You're just trying to get people to consider you and the way to get more people to consider you is to touch on more things. You're not, you're not the encyclopedia, you're not BBC. And even those things we've seen evolve, yeah. right? Like even CNBC or like, you know, like even like Wall Street Journal, like they, if you look at the history of publications needs to expand for relevance, yeah. even though they started as something very narrow, it's the inevitable chess move. Nobody's gonna eliminate you because you touched on two different things. This goes back to how I think it really works. I would challenge you to also add to your content what fly fishing taught me about business and make the whole first 17 sentences about fly fishing because you love it or darts or hockey or rock climbing or surfing or chess. We need connection points. When we're going through that stream on LinkedIn, I'm more likely to stop if you're talking about knock hockey than if you are talking about the metaverse. You You see where I'm going? Do you have a sense, before we run out of here, do you have a sense of which communication style suits you best? Audio, video, or written word? uh, Probably written word or video. I mean, I don't mind being on camera. Well then if that's the case, you should do video and then transcribe, have an intern or lowest cost transcription, right? Think about the double benefit. You know, if you're willing to do video, I mean, I have a lot of, I've written five New York Times best-selling books and have never written a sentence of it. It's all out of my mouth video, transcribed to book. Even the last book, because I did during COVID, literally, they, like my team visited me at my apartment, I just talked, we just filmed it all. So, and now you have much more content if you film it, 
that you can use in other places. So I would definitely lean into the video and transcribe it to the written word. Even if you directly are doing an article, speak it, if you can, and let that be the written thing because then even the video becomes extra, now all of a sudden you're at 12 a week instead of 12 a month. That's how you get there. Make sense? Yeah, cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Gary, thanks for having us. You've been a huge inspiration to how we built Bia. We've listened to a ton of your 4D, so it's an honor to be here. First. Humbled. Um, I'd love to give you just a bit of a yeah, plan so you, you can have more context. But we launched last year. I think the first year was us really figuring out, do we have product market fit? Does sure. this resonate? We've hit that. We're a mid-six-figure business right now. We're profitable. We're reinvesting every dollar in, so we're barely profitable. Um, for customer we- acquisition? No, we have not done any paid marketing, no paid All word of mouth. Yeah. Yep. So that's kind of how we built the business and kids want to share more about it. Makes sense. Content. Yeah, we both heard uh, one of your podcasts one night and then the next day decided we're doubling down on content. So we're doing about three to four pieces of content per social platform. We have a newsletter and we're per. Uh, for Instagram. That I understand. Facebook. Three or four per platform per week? Day? Per day. Per day. Mm-hmm. So how many, what total per day? Uh, oh, um, 12 to Love, 12 love to you. 20. Yeah, 20. So pumped with you. Yeah. And, then we and it's working? It's working? Oh, it's been so wonderful. Well. Did everybody hear that? Yeah. <laughs> three times a week? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I mean, three times a day. There we go, my man. <laughs> Progress. So we were doing a little bit of influencer marketing in the beginning, and then we decided to double down on our own content. Yes. It's working way better. Yes. Yeah. So it's been fun. Um, you know how like, you know, like I always tell people in this one, they're always like, Gary, why is that? I'm like, you know how you love, we all love children? Like children, we universally all agree, like we love this seven year old. We love our children more. Yeah. An influencer can only love your product so much yeah. compared to you. Totally. Yeah, so newsletter, about to start a podcast, which we'll probably put on YouTube and we're trying to decide all of that right now. Um, you wanna talk about that for half a sec? Cause it's super important, I think you'll do well. Yeah. We started to record content. Um, we're trying to decide. We're we're, in, we're uh, interviewing a lot of experts, but we also want to do our own original content. So we're we started recording, but we haven't figured it out exactly. When you say your own original content, just you guys on the show? Just us. Yeah. So I would do both in one show. Let me tell you how to figure it out. Back to and versus or. Think in segments. I think the show should start with five to seven minutes of you guys. Think about. Oh, Regis and Kelly, like they like banter in the morning, like blah, 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 blah. guess, 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 close the show. So I think the way you should do it is do six, seven, eight minutes of you guys, 30 minutes with the guest, six, seven minutes of you guys to close out. Maybe that one has like a little segment or a little game or hot take or you do something with each other or like for name association or whatever and then you're done. And then you have the post-production for all of it. Segments. And the way we're thinking about it, so YouTube for sure, and I have a podcast, I've been doing it for like two and a half years weekly, personal, just passion of mine that gives me energy. And, Love that. Um, thank you. And we had some health interviews and we saw it really works. We would now want to double down on YouTube. I guess for us, like, I don't know if I'm being too conservative with our marketing dollars. We have not spent anything. Like, what do you think, how do you think we should prioritize? Well, you can't get more conservative than zero. <laughs> right. I know. I probably need some help. But Ed, should we be spending, where should we be focusing on Marketing, I mean, doubling down on YouTube, like that makes sense. When you guys have, tell me a good war story of a piece of organic content that went viral, go. Uh, the, I, well, which one were you gonna say? I, was, I mean, we have a few, but one on Instagram, it was like over a million, it was this like cocktail, mocktail that we did. You, you, should, do, yeah. you should take that video and run ads against that, against target audiences. Because the algorithm, aka the human beings, everyone's like Mark Zuckerberg, China, It's fucking humans responding to shit. These platforms are very simple. They just want people to stay on it for as long as possible so they can run ads. So they're not, like, like Zucks isn't pushing propaganda of like you loving VR. They're just fucking math. Mm -hmm. And so so for you, that mocktail Mm -hmm. should be turned into an ad. Even if it's not like, because we do a lot of education, so even if it's not our specific product, it's a healthy, hormone-friendly... Correct. Product. It's giving people awareness to your brand. Mm-hmm. It might not be sales-oriented. Mm-hmm. Like, you might run $1,000 against it and get no sales, and you'll be like, fucking Gary. But meanwhile, what I know is that you did get sales, you can't attribute it to it. 
So now people feel fond towards you. Three weeks later, they decide to buy it. They just go to the website because they know who you are, but you can't point to the ad and you're like, the ad didn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, the ad's definitely going to work because it already went viral. People are interested. I'm incredibly bullish on everybody here running ads after it succeeded on organic. That's something that we haven't lived in for a long time because it's not how the platforms worked. So we have it way better than we did the last 10 years. We have to guess and run money or run micro money, see if it worked and then poured fluid on it. Now the algorithm does a better indicator if it's gonna work than even our micro ad spends. So like to me, if you're gonna test some stuff, test it on the things that go viral on your 12 a day. Okay, got it. Yes, at some point, the holy grail for DTC businesses is to find scalable math that works in CAC and LTV. The problem is most of them aren't actually working profitably. They're using VC money to subsidize their underwater CAC and LTV. And then there's eventually a funny game of chicken of can you sell it before your math runs out? Which is a fucking challenging game. And one that I don't like to play because it's like a fake business. See how the B guy got going? Because he knows, that's what he sees every day, right? They're on the other side trying to decide is this sustainable or is this a moment in time and da, 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 da. Keep going. Yeah, and I mean, one thing that we're not doing right now, we're doing three to four pieces of content, but we're using that same content on different platforms and that's gotten us to where we are. So what do you Are you changing the copy? We are. Good, well, so you'll take the same video, yeah. Okay. So like, that's a quick hack that can really help a lot of people here. It's the same video, but the copy's different because the audience is different on TikTok than it is on LinkedIn, than it is on Twitter. So something to think about, just copy changes or just slight little edit changes can matter. Yeah, we've been doing a little bit for YouTube, uh, like the things that people search on. Shorts? shorts. And what are you seeing? a Ish. Bit. Some, some traction, mm-hmm. but I think yeah, we're also gathering, we're talking to Joe, maybe making content exclusively for YouTube. Look, even I have a repurposing model with context, but like there is no comparison. When you can make for a platform, because when I'm saying hey TikTok versus hey everyone, there's a noticeable difference. Mm-hmm. It just, you know, I'm running a ton of businesses so it's hard for me, so I get it, and, but it's real. But the copy for sure. Don't mail that in because it doesn't take a lot of time. You know, like there's certain things that you can mail in, aka like you just don't have the time or resources energy. Mm -hmm. But the copy, that's mundane. Like yes, I know it's easier to control C and control V, but like thinking like this person's on Instagram versus this person's on TikTok matters. Copy in the description and title if you have it on the content. Yeah, if you're in the editing mode and you can change the title, like titles, the thumbnail and titles. I mean, I don't know if you saw the viral video of Mr. Beast. Like he spent hundreds, of thousands of dollars on the thumbnail. Mm-hmm. Now he's playing at the single highest level, but I understand I'm spending millions of dollars on a team that is doing the same thing in theory. Yeah. It's, it's actually scary how much the title and the thumbnail works, which is why if you have a piece of content, keep this in mind, that you really like, you just feel good about it, and you post it and didn't go, retitle it, change the preview screen, change the copy, go again three months later, six weeks later, four weeks later. Well, I feel like we have a product that, I mean, we have- How much is it? It's 45, so we have a one month bundle because you take it daily, it's a daily thing to support your hormones. So it's 55 for one month and then you can get three months which drops it down to 45 a month. And there's no one year? We don't have a one year. Why? No reason. What I like about one year is people forget to unsubscribe and like, like things of that nature and like, you know, like it's definitely worth debating. You have longer tail, you know, to re-get somebody to, to get somebody to re-up at month four versus the amount of people that forget or are passive or neutral yeah. or apathetic to it for one year is a lot of money. That's interesting, yeah. How big is your drop off after three months? The average right now for our users is 4.8 months that they're with us. Yeah, I literally think if you go to 12 months instead of three months that that number would be 9.7 months. Yeah, they're gonna be scared shitless of that if you're gonna raise capital. Yeah, yeah. It's just too expensive to re-engage. Yeah. What are you doing with your lapsed users? I got something really good for you. I got a real good one for you, ready? Yeah. I think that you should call 
on speakerphone every single person who's no longer subscribed and once was for three months. I think you should videotape the interaction of you saying thank you, not try to sell them to re-up, but just to build a relationship around the content. Mm -hmm. And when you have successful conversions, you ask them if they will allow you to put out the video of this successful reconversion. I think there's something there, there, there. Well, first of all, the reason you should do it is market research. Yeah. I'm adding content creation and reactivation of business. Mm-hmm. And I think you're small enough still where you could just grind that. Yeah, yeah, totally. But we are all about radical customer support. Like, yeah, so calling, yeah. literally calling and saying, I just want you to, I just, we just want to thank you for ever being on our service mm-hmm. and just hopefully it brought you some value and hope it sprung you into action theoretically whether you know we're obviously aware that you're no longer using us but I hope it's sprung you into a better you mm-hmm. thank you the most in, so I used to do this quite a bit for wine library the most fun part of the phone, phone call is when you're done just doing love yeah. and good and there's this awkward three second pause because they're waiting for you to give them an offer to reactivate yeah. but you don't Try it, even if you don't record it, which is probably the biggest friction of everything I just told you, I think the market research you'll get to why people unsubscribed. Like by the 19th call, if they all said the berries were the problem, you're like, oh fuck, should we even have berries? Mm-hmm. Like, it, like it's real market research. Yeah, yeah. Time. Christine and team, we got hey. a tip and high five. All right, so I guess we're in a little bit myself here before we talk about the raising money on, on an NFT platform is we're B2B. Yeah. But now I've been forced to B2C a little bit because consumers want it so so dramatically. So talking to the big guys, big multinationals, they're starting to realize they need our pea protein to reformulate all the way through. Like all of Korea is on board, you see what you they're all wanting to swap out soy protein with our pea protein. So how do I put the message together? And I'm not gonna say we don't actually go on TikTok and stuff yet, but it's okay. you know, um, What's that? I mean, if you were if you were B to B up to this point, TikTok is not the logical place to go. Yeah, yeah, and so a little bit of LinkedIn, being cautious because we're small and big guys are watching and wanting to stop me. So, how would you sit and go? Okay, what's my marketing approach to get the knowledge to to get the, the radical fans, as you said, behind it? So when we approach with HiFi here and do this NFT launch, we get those investors that come behind it. I'm sure HiFi will tell you like the conversion of, you know, the, what's really fascinating about the crowdfunding, the Jobs Act, this whole genre of the last 10 years is it's great on paper in the way that a lot of our ideologies are. Like our fans are gonna, but like, you know, and I'm sure they have plenty of case studies through this. Like the, the narrative is, When people invest, even in micro levels, they want a return on their investment. You know, there's like, you know, that's very important because you can get very caught in the ideology of like people want pea protein in the world for a better place. When they're writing a check, like they really do want it to return. Even when you look at over the counter stock in the popularity of Nike and Starbucks and Tesla and Netflix. There's really fascinating psychology in like how people invest. They'll do it for proxy. They'll buy five shares, feel good that they love Puma. But you know, I think a couple things. One, the thing that's gonna make them convert is the financial story, not the ideological story of like why soy is bad or this, that, the other thing. So that's very important because I've watched every single Kickstarter every single Indiegogo, every single, you know, modern NFT fundraising thing, like people think this, like they, they think the consumer cares more about the story than they do. Outside of the occasional like Robin Hood, like, like where it's like a memification Reddit GameStop thing, which is much more deeply in the human psychology of like fuck the man than it is thinking of a fuck that it was GameStop. You know, you've got to make sure it's about the actual business story. So that's one like very like curveball that like has to be grounded in. Um, 
as far as, so another thing real quick that you said that's important. I have historically seen that people scare, are scared to put out too much content because the big guys are gonna squash them. But by then not putting out the content, they don't get the awareness for the thing they wanted to get done. And one thing that we all know about the big guys is they're slow and they'd rather M and A it anyway. Right? Notice how many giggles we just got, right? Right? We just all know that. Like it's I get it. I think that's the boogeyman. I think what you need to do is dismantle it on LinkedIn. I really do. I because LinkedIn will service you twice. It'll service you for the the business development deals because you're making content that you know you're gonna target. I mean, you could literally target the job. T- so who are the, what's the job title description? What's the, what's the job one holds in the big companies that works with you? What are they? The chief what? COO, yeah. The fact that you can literally target the COOs of the Fortune 500 CPG companies with creative is fucking bananas. Yeah. Like LinkedIn didn't get caught up in the issues that Facebook did, so their targeting is still remarkable. And so now if you know this video or this article or this image is gonna be targeting the COO, well then you know what you're gonna say. Yeah. Which is then becomes the same game of what you're gonna say to the general population of LinkedIn and YouTube Shorts is where I would go because of the search capabilities on the over-the-counter play that we're about to get into. Yeah, we have two navigator subscriptions to, for this kind of targeting. That's right. That's right. That. That's right. No, exactly, exactly. But that is sales. The navigator is spam email at scale. I want content. Mm-hmm. Like the reason it took people a long time with LinkedIn was LinkedIn obviously started as recruiting and then when it got into marketing, it was lowest common denominator email marketing. Let's just spam the fuck out of all the people with the right, right. titles and get lucky, right? We all were receiving end of this. We all know what I'm talking about. Where, ticked, where LinkedIn got cool and interesting was, and I started talking about it, was three, four years ago when it started acting like Facebook, right? Sales Navigator, to me, is what I told those two wonderful ladies to do, which is go very one-on-one. Like, we, human, people forget that humans are animals. This is back to like your tummy and your gut. Humans are animals. None of us are confused by a bulk email. We don't even consume it. And the people that do, like you probably don't want it to be doing business with if they got tricked by a bulk email, right? So, so I think on the sales part, you go one-on-one. I'd much rather go one-on-one there. Hey, Don, saw you went to Duke because you looked at their LinkedIn. Go Devils. <laughs> anyway, uh, like, you know, like, and then on the content, you go broad. Right. Right. Oscar, question. Gary, what do you think of the, um, the state of the NFT market? Is it ready for a headline? NFTs, a transition from foolishness to seriousness. I think, yeah. contract is an NFT. Yeah, I think, I think it, I, I surely think it is. Okay, good. I think uh, it too. 100%. Like, you know, when I was saying all last year, 99% of these things are going to zero, nobody wanted to hear me because yeah. they wanted to make the quick buck. Thank God I did that because I think it would have really hurt my reputation. I'd be in a much weirder spot right now if I didn't pound that message. Thank God. But not thank God, because that's like how you do business. You gotta talk about it. I'm in this, you know, to, I mean, it's the only reason I'm interested in NFTs. If NFTs destiny was to be as big as the collectible market, I wouldn't have spent the last 18 months on it every hour. Its destiny is to be the contracts of our entire society. Good, yeah, I think the market's ready for it too. So we wanna tell that story. We think it's a top level story that has uh, potential to go quite viral if we tell the story well. But I don't think, even if it went viral, mm-hmm. even if you two are on CNBC talking about like why you saw the real power of NFTs, I don't think it lends itself to people investing in the company. Okay. This is where I started my convo with. You have to be very thoughtful on this. What I think your content needs to be is why you have a good business. Mm-hmm. Pound the living shit out of that. Mm-hmm. Because I think you're right and it might bring some general awareness. It may lead to some cool business development opportunities. Yeah, I want to cross-pollinate the NFT market with our- You know what I mean? I think, I think yeah. I, and it goes to and. Just because I said that, just because I don't think 47,000 people are ready now to write a $1,000 check because you've got that article on CNBC and Business Insider, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. If all of you leave with anything here, it's this obsession of and versus or. Like, you know, how are we gonna do just us or the influencers? Why not both? Like we really think there's these decisions instead of just trying to push and always. 
So I think there's some fruit there, potentially, but the news cycles, I mean, also you're like, for all of us, if we're thinking about PR, like, I mean, between the recession and the American election, like, I'm not even thinking about the rest of this year. There's like, nobody's gonna give a fuck about anything. You know, so I think keep that in mind because there'd be a lot of noise in the system and a lot of anxiety in the system. People don't give a shit about anything when they're scared. What do you think about the story of uh, traditional bricks and mortar meeting FinTech? So here you have a very conventional bricks and mortar business. Your pilot facility is 19,000 square feet. She's building a much bigger one right. to meet her demand. Yes. She's coming to the FinTech space. So now we have a crossover. We have traditional manufacturing business with innovation coming into a space, which is an innovative business itself. Yeah, I think, I think that will be more challenging okay. is my intuition only because if you really look under the hood, the smart money mm-hmm. already understands that our technology is like talking about the internet. Like when I first did winelibrary.com, like people wanted to write that article, like liquor store has website. That was the story. That's like, right, the reason everyone's giggling now is that's insane. And I think, I think at some level, I, I get where your energy's coming from. I just don't know if you're gonna get buy-in from anything that's gonna get significant reach. Because I think most of the business publications, and I've been in this storm for the last two years, 18 months, the kind of cat's out of the bag of like, this is a macro technology. I think your spidey senses are right from like normal people still haven't grasped that. But the, the media, like the business media does understand that. And I'm not sure like, P warehouse goes to blockchain is like gonna like completely compel them. But again, I don't want to be the, the beacon of no. I think it's worth a shot. Okay. If you're asking me the question, I don't I don't think it's the story the same way it was 18 months ago. I do think the it's time for us to get serious about what NFTs are is definitely gonna be a universal story. My biggest passion though is for you to pound the content to why you have a good business. Because if you if you're banking on HiFi, which I know you, but you but you have yes. to. It's yes, exactly. He no, wouldn't be yes. here. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. No, but yes, which is a perfect answer of a real operator. You would really like this to be a financial execution of money raising. It's going to be based on how much you can compel the masses to think you've got something good. Yeah, and so like we, so I have investors obviously at the table, and I'm of course devil to dance with. So if this was something that, you know, we haven't tried it, so we're gonna test it with a soft raise of five million to 10 million, whatever. And we have people at the table that are going to- I totally get it. That, right, we're setting it up for success. But you know, I have the 50, $100 million players over here, they're coming in, but then they wanna take your company. Of course, this is so much, you have much so, more leverage this so way, of course. Like dip over here, dip over here. The only way you're gonna do that is have mass amounts of people interested in the business. Yeah. And that comes through the content about the business. About the business. Mm-hmm. Like why it's a good business. Like why the, cons- and where you bleed it into where you want it to is the consumer trend is showing X. Yes. That. I noticed when we told the story together about sort of the tale of two CEOs innovating, it blew up for content. The fact that we had, like, we had a blended news release. We Love it. Together on LinkedIn, it, it shot off. And, yeah. and, and. Okay. And. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. you see where I'm going? It's just so common for us to go. It's always and, mm-hmm. more. The cost of entry is so low, the back end of it is so high. Why wouldn't you, I mean, why wouldn't we? I'll be way more focused on the business and less on the content. I'll, I already had like no Jessica problem. telling I'm me. I'm thrilled. And, and Joe saying Yeah, that we're talking about building out the I, infrastructure. I should start like a podcast and, and start getting like those um, decision makers on the podcast so I can get like more content so I can put yep. it out. Yeah. But in terms of the business, yes. Um, so when I got to this threshold, um, I feel that I'm a little alone in those decisions of my own business. Makes sense. Um, and I don't have that second tier of management. Um, and I got scared. Uh, Makes scared sense. of what? Like, I'm in a big sea, lots of sharks. I'm a little fish um, making myself out there and successful out there because I've been growing uh, yes. year after year. Um, so I got scared. So uh, the first question would be, how do you know when you should sell or you should just keep investing on yourself or building that second tier team? It's a very personal question. First of all, there is no, unlike a lot of the questions here where I think there's a real path, I always believe one should sell 
if they want to sell. Let me break that down. The thought of ever selling any business I've been involved in has been zero. We sold Empathy Wines because my partners were of the life cycle where both of them were on the precipice of getting engaged and starting their next real chapter of their lives and the dollars associated with selling it were high and it was gonna change their lives but I was like devastated. <laughs> like, cause, like, you know, cause I just never even wanna have a company that I don't wanna have forever but if you are tired or interested in something else or just wanna put the dollars in like, but selling out of fear because you think something bad's gonna happen is not a good reason to sell. That was pretty much a reason. Uh, so when building like... Uh, because I'll tell you why. The little fish can always succeed because there's not enough sharks in the world to fill up how big the sea is. It's a really big propaganda that sharks have scared small fish into. There's just too much out there. And inf- Influencer marketing, there's unlimited brands and unlimited gaming influencers, let alone influencers, for the rest of your grandchildren's life. What are we talking about? Sure. Right? Sure. Um, the toughest part with that is um, one of the biggest uh, advantages of working with Matchup Influencer has been like we really care about our clients. And the fact that we are on the side of the brand and less on the side of the talent uh, gives us that advantage. And with always understanding that we don't want to change the type of content of the content creator. So we respect this content. So that's not what we are there for. But on the other side, we are not a talent agency that we are going to the brand and say, we have this talent that can promote uh, your product. I agree. So, the biggest thing is, is it goes with the motto of my company is we connect brands with audiences, not with influencers. So Smart. way more important than finding I the influencer is got writing it. the, the I understand audience. the business model very well. Yeah, amazing. Uh, so in terms of like building that business, should I invest in preparing the people that are already working with me and bringing them up, promoting them to Always first, cho- always first choice, because when you're homegrown, you have context. When you're working with people for a length of time, you know a lot. When you're hiring from the outside, you're guessing, right? But the question becomes, do you feel confident in anybody who's internal? Or do they have the skills? Well, the question becomes, do you feel confident in them? Because skills are teachable. About the will, like, or just the way they work with you, or who you think they are as a human being. How many employees do you have? Um, I, I just readjusted. No I problem. Had like eighteen. Good. I'm with twelve. Good. It's smart. Um, There's a lot going on. Yeah. So of those twelve, when we're talking like this, who do you feel like? When I, how many people of those twelve do you feel like can really actually grow? That, that work well. That yeah, that you think about these 12 and you're like, I could see in four years him or her or him actually being quite senior. I would say that they are all good people yep. um, with, with um, uh, devoted to what they do. If in three years you have to go away for a year, mm-hmm. in three years, and you have to go away for a year, of those 12 people, how many do you think can grow into someone you feel you could trust to keep an eye on the house while you're gone for a year? I trust them. I just don't know if they have the skills, but you already said that I can get them the skills, teach them you the can. skills. I would say I have like people inside that I can do. Well, those people that you're thinking about need to get an obnoxious amount of your time. Not your clients. The biggest mistake a company of this size does is they spend most of their energy on getting new clients or with their clients or scouring influencers when they should be spending all their time with the 12 people. When I think about this organization, how we got to 1,500, 2,000 people, it was because of the time I spent in 2011 to 2014 with 100 of them, which 39 are still here, 10 years later. That's the organization. I also think that you hiring one person that fills the gap of this insecurity, curiosity, pondering that you're feeling is very, very, very good. And I would hire it from something that is exactly like you. Meaning, hire them from an organization where they're the number two or the number three, which is probably even better, that does similar work, whether they represent the talent or the brands. 
Because I think just feeling your energy, you need to scratch that itch. Just that one first person. To be, not having a right hand is very discomforting for a leader. I always had that, right? I, was, I, I recruited my best friend Brandon to be that with me and I had my cousin Bobby and I had my dad and then when I started this I had AJ, right? Then we started bringing people in. James when AJ was going through his transition, so. One final question. Please. Um, we have like in terms of our content, what we have been producing in terms of Reels and, and TikTok has been focused on the influencers or what influencers have been doing with us, right? Uh, but that doesn't get us to the point. No, the influ- what the influencers are doing with you run as ads on LinkedIn against CMOs in Canada of brands is what you should be doing. Did you get that? Yep. What the, influ- the work, the, con- the content that the influencers do, then you post, by the way, you want a good one? You green screening video of an influencer doing work with one of your brands and speaking to why this was well integrated or what brands should be looking out for, and then posting that. So you green screen it on Instagram, you post it on Instagram, it's gonna get 13 views. You then take that video and post it on LinkedIn and write 15 sentences or four or five, and you make it towards CMOs or heads of media agencies, that will get you business. Thank you. And that's a wrap on this session, you guys. If we want to have chances to get pictures with Gary from his office, we got to get doing that now. Uh, so let's walk out. Julie, can you Thanks, walk team. Crew down to Gary?